the concepts of what a promise is. The principles essentially of a promise, so just to remind ourselves, because a, a promise is a serious commitment between one party and one or more others. And we'd all agree, really, a promise should be kept. In fact, if someone breaks a promise, we feel disappointed, we feel hurt. In fact, we'd be more reluctant to trust if there's any future promises made. So when promises are kept, we trust that future promises will also be kept. Well, in the book of Numbers, we read this quote, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? Well, well what we, the writer there is trying to get us to understand is that God does promise and he does fulfill. He doesn't say something and then not act on it. Far from it. And we'll consider later on the fact that God cannot lie. So when God makes a promise, it is a sure and certain thing. It is not like a man made promise which can be broken. God's promises are different. And we, which is exciting for us, can be partakers of the promises in the Bible. God's promises to mankind began right in the beginning in Genesis. From the beginning of time to our day now, the promises can include us and those who have gone before. God's purpose from the beginning of time was that he would offer salvation through Jesus. So Jesus was always there. In God's mind, as a salvation, as a solution to the problem which was introduced in the Garden of Eden. In fact, the Old Testament is full of prophecies and promises which give details about God's plan. The writer to the book of the Acts writes, all the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. So there is lots of evidence in the Old Testament relating to the promises and the prophecies relating to Jesus, and then we can apply these in our lives. Well, who else writes about these promises? Well, let's just take a quick look at who else has spoken about these promises and how they relate to Jesus. Well, first off, we're going to consider the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul writes, he, as he's a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, he says here in Titus 1, in faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life, which in God who cannot lie, promised before the world began. So God, who cannot, before the, uh, who cannot lie before the world began, he's, he's given us this promise, the hope of eternal life. And then Paul, once again, when he's in defense before the court of Caesar, he says, it is because of my hope in what God has promised our fathers, the Jewish fathers before, that I'm on trial, trial today. He had hope in those promises in the Old Testament. To the believers in Ephesus, Paul wrote that prior to belief and baptism into Christ, there were those who, uh, who weren't baptized in Christ were separate from Christ. They were excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of promise. They were without hope and without God. And we'll see later on that that situation changed and that is relevant to us. So what promises does Paul refer to? Well, I alluded to it earlier. We know Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, they died because they broke God's command. But at the same time, a promise of hope was given. God would provide a seed, a son, who is Jesus, who would suffer because of sin, but a sin a, a blow. And that blow is going to be ultimately destroying sin. Also, Paul refers to the fact that there was a righteous man named Abraham who was promised a land and a son and many descendants. And even though at the time of promise, Abraham and his wife were nomads, they were childless and they were old. But God told him that one day all the nations were blessed because of his seed. And that seed is Jesus. Well, these promises extend to us also, don't they? Because God repeats the promises to Abraham's son, Isaac, and to his grandson, Jacob, and to the nation of Israel as well. In the New Testament, Paul writes to the Christians in Galatia, and he says this. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So it didn't matter if they were Greek or Jew, man or woman, if they were slave or if they were free. They had been baptized into Christ. They had become part of Christ's family. And so they could inherit the promises as sons of Abraham and of God. Well, there was another person who received the promises of God, wasn't there? This was a man, David. 
about a thousand years after Abraham lived, Israel had a king whose name was David. God loved David and David loved God. And God made a promise to David that one of his line, a son, would sit on David's throne and rule from Jerusalem forever. We read that in 2 Samuel 7, we'll consider in a moment. So over the centuries, the Jews have remembered this promise. They've looked for this Messiah to come, this anointed one, a king who would provide this leadership. That's why the New Testament often refers to Jesus as the son of David. Well, what does it say in 2 Samuel 7? Well, it says this. And when thy days be fulfilled, speaking to David, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. And this is a, a promise which is yet to be fulfilled. This is a promise of hope that Jesus will come back to be the king and rule in Jerusalem on the throne of his father, David. So these promises of Jesus, the, these promises we've considered so far, are all intrinsically related to Jesus and only have relevance because of Jesus. Jesus, Jesus knew that his teachings and his miracles, even his resurrection, wouldn't convince everyone, though. He said, look, if they don't listen to Moses or the prophets, referring to the Old Testament, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. And that's exactly what happened to him, didn't it? So we, we, cannot, we cannot convince all to believe, even though there are these, these great and wonderful promises. Jesus knew this. But Jesus also knew the Old Testament prophecies, prophecies and promises, and he knew that they related to him. Well, let's consider one example of how we know that is true. After Jesus has been killed on the cross and he's raised from the dead, we read the account of Jesus walking on the road to Emmaus. And he meets these two men on the road outside Jerusalem. And he speaks to them about the events of the past week, about his entry into Jerusalem, his trial, his crucifixion, his resurrection. And he says to these men, they didn't recognize him at the time. How foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And Jesus then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So Christ used the Old Testament to show these men what must happen to him. These promises contained in the Old Testament concerning himself. So he starts with Moses, Moses who started in the beginning writing the scriptures for us. And that's how Christ explains the scriptures and, and explains and, uh, the promises which relate to himself. So Jesus emphasized the entire Old Testament, spoke of him. And these disciples knew the Old Testament. They just had not really understood the real message about Jesus. Well, how is this relevant to us? Well, we can know about the stories and the teachings of the Old Testament. Perhaps we've heard many of them. But we must understand that the key message is of Christ and his coming kingdom. The gospel message looking forward to Christ starts in Genesis, and it's fundamental to understanding the whole of the Old Testament. The New Testament helps us understand the importance of the Old Testament, and we're able to be partakers of those promises that Jesus is coming back to the earth to set up his father's kingdom and to rule on the throne of his father, David. So these promises, well, some of them are fulfilled, aren't they? The promise of a son, well, that's been fulfilled in Jesus. The promise of a land, well, that's been partially fulfilled. Israel became a nation again in 1948, almost 2,000 years after. And Jerusalem's now Israel's capital. Yet this promise of a righteous king and a, this king priest ruling and leading the world forever from Jerusalem is yet to be fulfilled. That is what we call the kingdom. And it is a vision of the kingdom which we look for. Because that promise is fulfilled in Jesus. In the New Testament, there is the book of Hebrews, which teaches us that these promises will be fulfilled forever in Jesus, who will be both priest and king, ruling over his father's kingdom on this earth. Let's just consider this now. In Hebrews chapter 6, we read, Be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises speaking to the believers at the time, but also it speaks to us, doesn't it? 
we read on. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. And God confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it's impossible for God to lie, we have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. And that, that hope which we all have is an anchor to our soul, both sure and steadfast, because the forerunner, which is Christ, has entered in before us, even Jesus. So by way of conclusions, then, these promises are fundamental to our hope. Understanding the covenants and promises made between God and the Jews helps us understand the new covenant made between Jesus and his followers. And we can be part of that chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, someone selected, drawn out, a people belonging to God. The way God wanted the original Jewish nation to be, set an example to the rest of the world in glorifying God. So what does it mean for us then? Well, we need to learn and to understand the promises God have, has made for us. We have to find out what we need to do to be part of that promise. We need to look into these things. We, we are giving a brief overview today, but we need to look into it more deeply. We need to consider what these things are. In Acts 13, we read, when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and they honored the word of the Lord. And all who are appointed for eternal life believed. We are Gentiles. We are non-Jews. We are seeking to share in the hope of this promise. Maybe there are a few Jews listening, but most of us are Gentiles who want to be partakers of that promise. And we can be adopted into that family. So what is our responsibility? Well, our responsibility is that we seek the Lord while he may be found. We call upon him while he is near. And Mark tells us we are required to be baptized because he that believes and baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be condemned. So what if we're already baptized? What is our responsibility? What if we've already made that commitment? What is our responsibility then? Well, our responsibility, we read in Romans 10, is that for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So our responsibility, if we have already made this commitment, is to preach. We are the preacher to share this good news. And that's what I hope we've done this morning. And as we've given a brief overview, there's a few more articles on these websites which you can access to get a bit more information on the things we've...